Week three on Islam, um, just going to run through as, as we're doing. We have these five, five or six things we look at every week. Um, well, I guess I'll push the button. Islam means submission to the will. Muslims are those who submit. We talked about that. Uh, ultimate concern, God. Allah is the name for God. Uh, Muhammad is his prophet, and monotheism is kind of the, the one of the great monotheistic religions. They're sacred writings. If you remember, this is the top of the priority <laughs> lens, the most important, the Quran that was thought to be uh, translated by the, I think, by the angel Gabriel to Muhammad and over a period of time. Um, it's going to be considered the pure word of God. Uh, the Hadith and the Sunnah are different traditions. This is a written one. This is mostly oral until relatively recently. Uh, this is the, some of the sayings and, and some of Muhammad. This is the practice of Muhammad, how he lived out Islam. Um, we talked about the five pillars, their ritual acts. Every good Muslim does these five things. Uh, <laughs> The, the profession, prayer, almsgiving, fasting, especially Ramadan, and of course the pilgrimage to Mecca. This we spent a lot of time on because it's really kind of fascinating uh, to think about what happens there, to see the numbers. If you remember the video last week that I think it was three or four years ago, 1.8 million Muslims came to Mecca at the same time for this. It was crazy, in the words of Amy Farrakhala, um, for those of you who know she is. Uh, then we talked about moral code. We spent most of our time last week talking about this. Um, this is a word that we probably know, Sharia law, I would say, um, usually used in a negative as we're talking about the world, uh, wondering where, as particularly as the, the, the migration of Muslims is happening and also um, just the 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 reality that we know more about them, this, this idea that Sharia law will be enforced. But we looked at this is literally meant to be the path that you should follow. And it's broken down in a lot of ways. So I hope last week you got a little bit of the sense of, while it can be a threat, it can be oppressive, there are various classes of law from you better do it to you better not do it and everything in between. Um, you know, this is required. If you if you don't do it, you sin. This is, you know, you should do it. It's helpful to do it, but it's not a sin not to do it. This is kind of, well, you know, maybe good, maybe bad, not really. This is, it's better if you don't do it, but you won't be punished if you do. And this is don't do it. Um, in fact, this word haram is interesting, kind of the prohibition word. They also call their, we'll talk about this when we talk about mosques, their, their holy spaces are called harams. In fact, the Meccan mosque, the largest mosque, I believe it's the largest in the world, I know it's the most sacred to Muslims, is the Al-Haram Mosque. You would say, why is it all bad? You know, because this is like the thou shalt nots of the Muslim. But this word of prohibition also has in it the idea of being set apart or holy, um, as we would say, it's not really a word that we would correspond to holy, so that don't think this is a translation. But the idea that it's, it's the prohibitions are there also means these sacred spaces are places where you better not do certain things. They're set aside and they're kept free from the do nots of the Muslim faith. So I thought that was an interesting kind of use of the word that on the one hand means don't do it, it's bad, and on the other hand means this is a sacred space for what it's worth. We also talked about, I don't know why this isn't working. I guess I should roll the battery and maybe I'll win that way. <laughs> uh, that, that the Sharia law, which is the big kind of overarching thing, is interpreted by Feeks, and there are five different schools of how to look at Sharia law. Um, the first four are all Sunni schools. The last one is a Shiite school. So, and, and these range from very strict, very 
uh, we might say more fundamentalist to somewhat conservative to maybe more liberal and, and even I believe it's Hamali or Maliki, I forget, I have to check my notes, is more activist. We might say lean toward even uh, the activism that we might see expressed in terrorism at times. Uh, so, so there are different ways that people look at Sharia law, depending on where you are, depending on the way the government enforces it and the interpretations of it. And, and I was surprised by that. You would think Sharia law, usually as I hear it and understand it, it's this little square. You better keep it or you're going to die. Well, if you're, I think if you're here, yeah, you're going to die. That's pretty much how it's going to happen. But this is a much more liberal. Uh, one of these is a much more liberal and, and more, more progressive school. Again, I have to check my notes for exactly. So, so that was interesting to me to think that um, sometimes the way we perceive Sharia is a little different. And, and by the way, on your notes, I'm not sure where this apostrophe goes. So I lost the apostrophe in your recent notes. I think I put it in the wrong place. Um, so I apologize for that mistake. Um, this was the map we used where we said in the green countries, um, this is where the government runs according to Sharia law. So Saudi Arabia, for instance, if you're in Saudi Arabia, that's a Muslim country. Sharia law is the law of the land. Now, which school might vary of these countries, but this means everybody there is, is there. Um, the red is certain parts are government enforced Sharia law. The yellows, these are the places where Sharia law is only enforced for Muslims. So if you're not a Muslim, you're, you're less likely. Of course, you see um, this is going to happen on a community level. This is not why, why green and red might be more governmental enforcement. The next two, the, the yellow and the blue, are more community things. Although we do have, you know, kind of, I don't remember if this is Yemen or Oman. I get them confused, um, these two. Uh, but, you know, in Qatar here, these are... The blue here is mixed, so you might find out it's going to be that way. So, it's, so it's, you know, and this is the one that maybe surprises me the most yeah. to see the a little Britain. yellow up here in Great Britain. Um, you're not surprised by the Middle East, maybe not so much North Africa, a little bit into South Asia. But when you see that yellow way up there, um, and if you've been watching the news, we talked about this, you've noticed there have been some issues and protests going on in Great Britain around um, Muslim communities and the like. So it's an interesting map um, to consider that. Uh, we talked about worldview. We looked at these two primary divisions of uh, Islam, the Shiite and the Sunni. About 85 to 90% of Muslims worldwide are Sunni. About 10% or so are Shiite. There are a few other small offshoots of that. Um, we talked about the fact that you can't say which one is the terrorist one because they're both have sex. They both have arms that can be more terroristically implied. Um, there's a third category we didn't really talk about. And this is not a third kind of Muslim. This is a particular expression of Islam that is more mystical. So more what? Mystical. No, so sect. Yeah, That's but right. but like Shiite and Sunni, it's it's not equivalent to these. Some Sunnis are Sufi, some Shiites are Sufi. Right. So Sufi isn't. Don't look at this as one, two, three. It's one and two. But there is a growing expression of some Islam. And this this is across both of these divides that are very mystical. Uh, these would be you know more monk like. They're not interested so much in the external world and and the enforcement of Muslim doctrine around, they, they have taken a more contemplative, mystical view, a more personal view of how Islam affects them. Um, I say growing. Uh, don't, don't misunderstand me. It's not going to overtake what would be the main expression of Islam, but, but it is a significant subset of that. Um, here is another map that when we talk about Shiites and Sunnis, all the light green, Sunni, dark green, Shiite. Um, this one we know, and this one we have some interest in um, because these are two countries that we have been involved in in history um, where there have been transitions from Sunni to Shiite and, and governments rising up. Um, okay, this is women in Omar, right? Afghanistan, we know a little bit about. Um, so, 
our involvement, you would look at this map, at least geopolitically, is, is usually in these. Um, and that's, that's twofold reasons. Obviously, uh, I'll, these are our countries um, that, that we have been in direct conflict with, in the case of Iraq and Afghanistan, um, after Iraq invaded Kuwait, that sort of opened the floodgates years ago. And we know about Al Qaeda and, and all that comes out of Afghanistan. Iran is, uh, we might say, kind of right now on our radar screens because of the nature of, of the issues with this little country, which, you know, this is not green, light green or dark green. It's the sole one in this whole region. Think about, you know, we talk about Israel being surrounded. <laughs> They're surrounded. Um, and while it's not green, we can't deny that there is a large Arabic Muslim population in Israel. Um, I, I don't want to equate Islam with Palestinians. There are Islamic Palestinians. Probably there are many Islamic Palestinians. These are also Christian Palestinians. I, our guide when I went to the Holy Land was a Palestinian who was a Christian. Um, he was kind of in the more uh, Orthodox tradition because that is one of the expressions of, of Christianity in, in the Holy Land. Um, not so much Protestant or Orthodox, but he was a believer and we talked, had conversations to that end. Uh, but part of the conflict for many of these uh, places and is that they have decided what has driven some of their geopolitical activity and what have we have responded to with our ally in Israel, as, and speaking nationally as, as a country, is some of these particular countries and uh, inside the country's Muslim groups have basically vowed to destroy Israel. Why is that? Well, because there was this thing that happened in 1948, you may be familiar with it, right? Israel wasn't a problem until 1948, but after that, and then we got 67 and the Seven Days War and all that stuff that happens. Um, well, it was the United that Nations that placed Israel. Israel. So the countries around did not have, they were not participating in the decision process that, uh, that uh, the world order. Israel. Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly yeah. built some bad feelings Absolutely. among that group. You know, not that there, there was, there was a, you know, I think Britain was in charge of Palestine primarily prior to that. Um, it wasn't like Palestine was its own little country and we just said, you're no longer a country, now you're, you're Israel, or not we, like I didn't do it, but you know, there's a lot of geopolitical realities that go on there. Um, uh, kind of goes back a ways. We've talked about Islam traces its beginnings from Ishmael, not Isaac. So this is an age-old conflict. Um, and so we've got kind of an interesting geopolitical map that, that explains a lot of what we're dealing with and what the world is dealing with, particularly, you know, right now. There was, was it today or tomorrow the ceasefire talks that were supposed to happen and I believe was it Iran that says we're not coming? Hezbollah said we're not coming. Did you have a is that, um, is our mosque mostly Shiite or is it not Persian? Like is it Sunni or I think I wrote that down. But I'll have to find it. So you can give us a wrong question. That's why why the uh, um not sorry. Iran. 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 Thank you. Yes. And uh and Iran is the ones that want to yeah. take the Jews out. Hamas is Sunni. So in my notes. Hezbollah is the other one. They are Shiite. Oh, Hezbollah is Iranian. It's interesting. Um, Al Qaeda was uh, Sunni. ISIS or ISIL, depending, is largely Sunni. And that shouldn't surprise you because 85 to 90% of all Muslims everywhere are Sunni. Yeah. And a smaller percentage are Shiite. And that doesn't go back to who we like, it goes back to the beginning who we thought should be Muhammad's uh, successor. Should it be a biological descendant or should it be, in this case, kind of his right-hand guy? Um, and so that was the split. The split wasn't ideological. It wasn't like we're more radical and they're, they're not, or, or we're more uh, war-minded and they're not. It was about succession. Um, now, 
So, so we can't, I, I don't, I, a lot of times I think we, we hear Shiite, we think, oh, they're the bad ones. Because a lot of what we deal with geopolitically is Shia. But, you know, go to Sudan and ask some of them if Shiite, Shiites are the bad ones. Mm -hmm. I have a much different answer. Um, Syria will have a different answer. Uh, so, so you know, what's going on in parts of the world um, that we're not as involved with is just as heinous as some of the stuff that we have been involved with. It's not uniquely. By the way, um, not to say, oh, the Muslims are bad. You can find segments of Christianity <laughs> that are just as heinous, we might say, true. and do things that, that we now. Now, hopefully there are very small segments and and hopefully the vast majority of Christians go, that is not us, but still they're there. And um, sure, go to Ireland. That's one place you could probably look at it. Um, but anyway, so not trying to both sides it necessarily, just to, to, to put in perspective kind of what's happening here. A um, couple other thoughts about this kind of Shiite Sunni thing, uh, because they, there are some differences. Um, Shiites governmentally are more higher, hierarchical um, in the sense that they elevate certain religious leaders um, to, to very important positions. So uh, one thing you might, you might not notice is if you're talking to a Sunni and they talk about their imam, Imam is a title for any priest. In a Shiite sense, Imam is usually capitalized and is meant to be a direct, there's only one at any one point in time that is the Imam, capital I, like the, the head dude, and he is traced as a direct descendant of Muhammad through Muhammad's daughter. It's his son-in-law that the Shiites thought Ali would, should be the rightful successor to Muhammad. And currently, I think I mentioned this last week, that the current leader is the His Highness Aga Khan, who has an unbroken lineage back to Ali and, and then to his beloved daughter, what's, it, what's her name? Bibi Fatima. So that's the guy today. Now there is a, there's also, and this may be another uh, Shiite sect you have heard about. Have you heard about the 12 imams? Is that a phrase that's circular? I don't know if it's so much out. Anybody heard of that at all? Sometimes they're called the Twelvers. So this is an interesting version of the Shiite expression of Islam. The reason they're called the Twelvers and they talk about the 12 imams is because they believe there were only 12. And the 12th imam and we're, you know, we're going back hundreds of years, you know, Muhammad 700 uh, AD, so 12 generations of imams from him. So we're not, like, this isn't modern. This goes back a ways. The 12th imam was thought to be hidden by God so that one day he would be revealed again. Sound like anything Christian? It's a very eschatological view of Islam, and they're awaiting the return of the 12th imam. So it's almost a messianic figure there that will trigger, in their version, kind of the end times, as it were. It's very much a a. There, there's it's quite a large sect in um, in the Shiite religion who may still acknowledge as a descendant of the prophet. What did I say? His His Highness Aga Khan, but ultimately don't give him the same authority as the first twelve, in particular that last. Imam. So there's an eschatological element to some of, of the Shiite view <laughs> of how they, they work. One other point about kind of this, well, well, let's move on to a bigger picture. Another word you may have heard of. This is where we left last week. <laughs> what is Bihar? What do you think? What's that? Change. Change? <laughs> At least I, that's what I thought. That's what that's what Todd thought. Any other thoughts? <laughs> Where are my notes on it? The, the word literally means to struggle. 
Struggle. So jihad is struggle or exertion. Um, when we hear the word jihad, we usually think the struggle is one of war. Right? <clears throat> jihad, holy war, is probably, if you were to ask many people yeah. what is jihad, they would probably say it's holy war. Um, now, while, again, that may be the case for some, and we could look at jihads that have been declared for instance, I believe there's been jihads declared against Israel and certain people there. There have been jihads declared against America at certain times by certain leaders. Jihad is not only in mind this idea that, that you're going to war. Um, that the idea is that you would struggle or exert yourself in your path toward God or in the, in the ways of God or Allah. That that's the point. It's supposed to be a religious thing. In fact, they call that that we engage in a greater jihad and a lesser jihad. I think I told you last week and reminded you that the, the Quran was written <clears throat> over a period of time. It wasn't like, here it is, all in one fell swoop. And at times, the revelations Muhammad received seem to be tailored to the particular circumstances that he was in. So when he is in Mecca, when he first starts this whole Islam thing, he gets these revelations. Um, jihad was also termed S-A-B-R, and it had its emphasis on the internal dimensions. It referred to the practice of patient forbearance by Muslims in the face of the difficulties of life and those who wish them harm. That's not holy. That's that's internal. But if you remember, what happens to Muhammad? He has to leave Mecca. He goes to Medina because he's facing persecution and he gets more revelations. And in this sense, jihad has as its meaning fighting in self-defense against your persecutors, against aggressors. And this is termed qital, Q-I-T-A-L. So S-A-B-R Saber, which kind of sounds like sword, that's how I would say it, is the internal struggle. But jihad can also be Q-I-T-A-L, Qatar, which is more the, the external struggle against persecution, against the aggression. Why would God give him that revelation? Well, because he's faced with a lot of persecutors and aggressors, and he wants permission, we might say. Now, that's a very cynical right view of, of how this is working. I admit that. Uh, it's kind of looking back and saying, historically, this makes sense. Why, why, why the uh, revelation kind of changed and morphed. Um, but there you go. That, that's kind of what happened. It, in some of the later literature, so, so we're moving out of his life and we're in the Hadith. So we're, we're out of the Quran, which is the, the tablets, the revelation from Gabriel. And we're in the traditions that were written down, the sayings and teachings of Muhammad. Okay, so we've taken a step down slightly in authority, not huge. We're not, it's not, not authoritative, but a step down. Um, the two main kinds of jihad, Saber and Qatal, are renamed Jihad al-Nafs, A-L-N-A-F-S, the internal struggle against the lower self, and Jihad al-Saif, A-L-S-A-Y-F, the combat with the sword. So now we, we, in his sayings that come up after the Quran, we, we've done that. And, and it's termed in those sayings, the Hadith, that the internal struggle, the spiritual struggle is the greater jihad. And the external struggle with the sword is the lesser jihad. And so when Muhammad came back from battle in that, in that particular um, section of the Hadith, it says in that he went from the lesser to the greater jihad for the remainder of his life once the battle was over. Um, so you see, you know, and even in some of the teachings, we need to understand, don't, don't hear jihad and think it's automatically somebody's coming to chop you down because there is a side of it. Now, that may be it. If somebody's running at you with a sword and says jihad, you know, yeah, they're probably thinking that. I don't know if that's ever going to happen to any of us, but, um, but it also has in mind that particular uh, internal structure. I say all this, I say all this, not 
to in any way. I mean, we could we could pick out parts of the Quran, and you've probably heard of them, death to infidels, and all that sort of thing. And they're in there. We can't deny that. It usually, as I said last week, uh, we just get that one verse, and we don't follow it up with some of the things like, as soon as you give alms, you don't have to die anymore because that's your act of repentance and acceptance of Allah. Most of the places where it says that, uh, those aren't usually quoted. But but nonetheless, my point is, it's just like with the Bible. <laughs> It's easy to grab a verse and say, ha, ah, they're awful people. People do that to us as Christians, right? They do. Now, I'm not saying Muslims are Christians. I'm not saying believe in Allah gets you to heaven because it doesn't. This is a false religion. This is not the God of the Bible, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is a false. So I just want to be clear about that, not softening any of that. But I am saying understanding that Sometimes a caricature of a religion does not represent the whole of the religion. That's the first time I heard you or anybody say this is a false religion. So, in the sense, it's it's a religion, but it's not following God; it's following us. right. It is not. And I, I, as I said before, I, I see your point, but this is the first time I've heard anybody. This is a false religion. Yeah. That's a plant. <laughs> And, you know, in fairness, if, if a Muslim was teaching about Christianity, you know what they'd say? Yeah, we're a uh, they, That's a false religion. They've got the wrong idea about Jesus. Just like we say, they've got the wrong idea about Jesus. And God. So, you know, I'm not declaring jihad on them. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, there's... It was funny when we were, when we were in Israel... Our guide is to call us infidels just because. Just for fun? Oh, yeah. Right. Now, infidels, come over here. <laughs> just like we weren't believers in us. <laughs> I mean, it was exactly. It was hysterical. Perfect. I mean, now, what's the word that they used it, when they attack Akbar? Yeah, Akbar. Akbar. Allah Akbar I, basically means Allah is great. Allah is the greatest. Okay. Because that's what they. You're quoted as saying when they began an attack. If, I believe, if you remember, I don't have it in my um, notes today. The call to prayer, that's how it starts. Yeah, where did I put that? I wrote that somewhere. Um, and that's just, and that's that's part of their prayer that, that, that Allah is the greatest. Okay. Um, that was one of the things they had to say when they got converted. They had that saying. They had to There's no God but Allah and yeah. Muhammad is his prophet. Why would they say it when they're going to try to kill people? <laughs> you know, you hear all the time they say that when they are going to kill somebody. I, I will. On the one hand, if they think they're fighting infidels, that's a proclamation of their faith, then Allah is the greatest. It could be something to buoy them to say, Allah is with me and he's the great. As I go into battle, it's a reminder that he's going to protect me. Or if he doesn't protect me, he's the greatest and he's the wisest. I'm making this up, by the way. I don't, I haven't read this. So just to be clear, it's my opinion. I could be wrong. But that would be, in my mind, it's just a battle. Kind of like there's no atheists in foxholes. It's like <laughs> that's their expression of faith as they're about to potentially do something that could result in their harm. Yeah. Did you find the prayer call? No, I I know I wrote it, but I haven't. Oh. I, I won't try to look it up. I'm pretty sure that's it. Okay, social organization. Let's talk about the mosque. The mosque is a very important uh, social organization, typically means in most faiths, how socially as a religion they express themselves. Uh, but for many religions, this also has an expression in their societal views. And for Islam, this would be the case. The mosque is meant to be the center of their societal structure, um, which is why what do you do on Hajj? You go to the most sacred mosque in the world. Why do you go to Medina? Why do you go to, to Jerusalem? These are the three most sacred sites. But all of the mosques share an important set of features. One of them, one thing that you have to have in a mosque is a place of prayer and or a courtyard that is able to fit the entire population of the, of the city you're in. 
Wow. So you, everybody in your town has to be able to come and pray. Now, the good thing is there are no stairs. <laughs> you don't have to have seats for everybody because you don't sit. No. But, but this is it. And the courtyard, depending on the strictness, might be where the women would stay as the men would go inside. Sometimes everybody goes inside. But, but the structure itself is supposed to have room for the entire community to gather. The expectation is when it's time to gather, you're going to gather. And that may happen five times a day. The reason you'll know you're supposed to pray, whether it's in the mosque or elsewhere, is the feature that is the minaret, kind of that particular um, defining characteristic you would think of of most mosques exists simply to get a high enough vantage point so the call to prayer can go out. That's what it's there for. This is not you know, just an architectural feature because they think it looks cool, but it's meant to be the high point so that everybody in town can hear five times a day, it's time to pray, whether they're able to come to the mosque or not. Um, when you enter in, this is usually an open courtyard with the porticos around it. Uh, most mosques will have an ablutions fountain, which is a place for washings before you go into the, the actual place of prayer. Uh, inside there. So there are just like in Judaism, there's ritual washings. If you go, if you've been to Jerusalem, you know, outside the temple, that's why those places are there that you would do that before you would go in for the high holy days, particularly this is, this would be any time you go into this area. It would be, as I said, not, not seats, not pews. It would be an open, usually carpeted area, because if you're going to go in there for service or to pray, you're going to, you're going to bow. You're going to be on your knees. You're going to prostrate yourself at the appropriate time. Well, usually, How, usually they have their prayer rug with them. So. And they can do that, too. So sometimes it's carpeted and they bring their prayer rug. But, yeah. Um, now, you know, but, uh, in American cities, do they have a minaret? Because they don't do the prayer call. I, I wanted one of the, in Tampa that was out on our end of town. It didn't have the minaret. And they did not do the prayer, the, the prayer call into the community. And it was not that big either, not considering the size of the family. Right. They, 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 they had one up in Homestead that used to be like a, a it wasn't like a moth mosque, but it was a Muslim. It, you know, it said that. And then there was actually, a, it wasn't as tall as I've seen them, but there was um, a minaret sticking up out of the building. I don't know what it became now, but it's not that now. But, I've heard where they ten years ago they used to be. I never they're heard to call use, they're, they're allowed to use loudspeakers. Oh yeah, like, oh in India, man. And, oh, uh, kind of they thing. call them for loudspeakers. Yeah, I heard of it in Israel and Jordan. Yeah, in, in Jerusalem, downtown Jerusalem. I'm sitting yeah. on the center, and there it is. It's it's there. Um, I don't know the the particular. I would guess because. This is not, they're a minority community in Tampa. A, they're not having to have a mosque big enough for the whole city as much as for their adherents. Right. right. And I wondered if it was because they had a big school with it. They had a school all the way from elementary through high school. That that would mean they wouldn't have a minaret? Yeah, you know, and do the prep. Maybe they do it internally, you know, the press office. Okay. Is there a comment or insight online somewhere? I hear well, I was just going to say that the um, they make clocks that have go off five times a day and have the call to prayer. So the places that don't have uh, minarets and the, the community call to prayer, they can have it individually. Okay, that's why I figured since it was the school, it did. That did it get and there may be ordinances where things are for noise or otherwise that would prohibit. Well, it may not be an actual mosque per se, then, like you said, that. if it was a school. So this is, has to do with if it's an actual mosque, then I have oh, to have that. The mosque like, first, yeah, and then they added this. But school. like the one up in Homestead wasn't actually a mosque; it was like it was a. A church, if you will. I mean, it was a building, but that was whatever I had written. I don't remember what I had written. Now you knew it was a place where Muslims went to pray, but it was not. A, and that, that could be, might not be considered 
uh, formally, uh, for my, what I'm reading, if you don't have these out, some of these elements, you're not a considered a must. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, notice here's our word. I don't know if you can see it. Haram. That word means this is the holiest part of the building. You come into this inside. Um, usually there's a large dome over the top of the haram. As a, you know, it's kind of like you would see domes in Catholic churches. They're meant to convey the majesty and the grandeur of heaven um, as they're reaching up. Uh, this, this wall is called the Qibla, Q-I-B-L-A wall. That's the wall that faces Mecca. So every mosque is oriented toward, has one wall oriented toward Mecca. How do you know what that is? Because on that wall and pointing the direction to Mecca is usually an arched kind of alcove inset of some kind called a mitrah. Um, here's one. I don't know where this is. If you were in this mosque, that is where you would face for prayer because that arched area, and, and all of them would have this, this is the way to Mecca. So that's the way you direct your prayer, actually specifically to the Kaba'ah, that box in the middle of Mecca. And then next to it is the pulpit. We would call it the pulpit. They call it the min bar, not the mini bar. That's a whole different thing. <laughs> um, the min bar. It's got steps up to where on Friday, the religious leader, the, the imam of that particular mosque will give his sermon, what we would call a sermon. He would give his talk on that time of Friday evening prayer. So it was asked, do they have a holy day? And it is Friday. That's kind of, that's, that's when this is used. So if you go into a mosque, I, I like this picture because you have a perspective of this guy sitting here. He's sitting. As you can see, this is, this is a big mosque. I think this is in either Turkey. Pretty sure it was Turkey when I found the picture. I, I looked for a lot. This is the clearest one when I made it bigger. Really, um, very pretty. <laughs> and you know, they usually have this this area of writing and, and all the tile and inlay. They're usually it's usually the most elaborate spot in the whole mosque is is this niche, this this place that says Mecca is this way. What's it called? The mir the mirror. So the, the most ornate spot, as you would expect, as a way to say if you're going to pray, How do you pray. Midra mid. M I H R A B. I don't know if I'm saying Arabic words right. So it's very interesting. Um, You're doing a good job of, of supporting the false religion. I'm faking it. Right? <laughs> so, like, like you would expect, um, if you've gone to any church of ornateness, part of the the purpose of the architecture is to draw their thoughts toward Mecca and God. If you see, look at all the carpets here. They're coming in to kneel. They're not coming in to sit. In which direction is, is Mecca? North, east, south, west? Depends on where you are. Yeah. <laughs> so it's in Saudi Arabia. So yeah, um, wherever you are, that, that niche will be pointed by the compass. I'm sure they have a very particular way of discerning where is Mecca from where we are. On, on this so, side of the planet, you can face it. To, to face Mecca, to it's face from this side of the planet. But but now, if you were in a mosque, that particular niche would be the the heading on your compass to get there. You're going to be very particular about that. Mm -hmm. um, the family would be another important social organization. Um, the mosque is the community center. The family is the basis. One of the things that you probably hear about Islam is it's a fast-growing religion. One of the reasons is because they have a lot okay. of large families. Um, and so that perpetuates it. Uh, the family structure is important. The family is the basis for the education of the kids. That's where you're going to be introduced to the faith of Islam and expected to participate in all the activities of the mosque. So... I don't, while we have, you know, Sunday school Bible studies, they don't really have as much of that, though. You know, they have the five times of prayer a day. It's very, I want to say, we would say maybe more ritualistic than, than ours, but, but the family is where a lot of that's going to happen in connection with the mosque. That's going to be the, the basis. That is why, um, well, they're growing. Because I think somebody brought this up the last time I was here, so two times ago. And just when you're talking about how important it is, the family is important, how that's where they teach them everything. And I'm thinking now in 
you know, with school, they, you know, kids are in school, how they ensure that their children are participating in prayer during a regular school day. You know, like uh, they came to a Muslim school. So what but would they saying? just they would send them to a Muslim school then, probably, right? If, if maybe, maybe not. I would, I would have to yeah. look. You know, no, I, just I'm just, it's. I know it got brought up before. I was just it made me just think now with school starting again. You know, it's like. So if if you're in one of those countries where Sharia law is a law, well, then you can everything to, revolves yeah. around exactly. learning and following Sharia law. Yeah. But they may not be like you know, family comes here and they're. They may not be as, I don't know, it's just interesting how they... And, and I think, so I don't know this, so I'm, I'm going to make a, an assumption. A lot of times we, we're we looking at the parts of the world where we think school, what does school look like in North Africa? What does no, school exactly. look like? Don't look like I don't know. No. I know they have schools because I've seen yeah. kids and all, but what does it look like? Is it our view? Is it? But I was thinking more like if a, if a, if a Muslim family lived... Here in America, you know, you know, which they, a lot of them do, but you know how they balance, I guess, you know, Americans' uh, socialist socialism and school and all that stuff with their yeah, it's it's probably why you see for a lot of you know, yeah. Jewish communities, yeah. Miami Beach, you go there, it's a large Jewish population because they, they share they from they values. Local, yeah. And and I the same for, for Muslim communities. So a lot of those communities are Muslim communities. They're also for the school. There are some strict yeah. limits that yeah. girls yeah. cannot be educated. Yeah. Um it, it's it's both. It's not one or the other. It depends on the particular view of Sharia law you take. And how conservative you are. Last thing, and then we'll be done. I think it's last thing. So, some some books that are interesting. Um, around the world, it's fascinating to me what's happening, that there are Muslims coming to Christ. Absolutely. That's not a surprise, right? It's the way that they're coming to Christ that is really remarkable to me. Um, this book is uh, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. Good book. I read it. I have it. Um, Jim Brummett, when, when he was around, he gave me this book, if I'm not mistaken, at one point to uh, before he passed to read. It's a story of a devout Muslim who encountered Christianity and what happened to, to draw him to Christianity. Um, you may be familiar with The Insanity of God. There was a movie out a few years ago. This is a Southern Baptist missionary who talks a little bit about his own journey with um, illness and I believe death of a child, but his, his uh, ministry was in Somalia. Um, and, and he tells the story of a guy he got to meet. This is toward the end of the book. Fascinating thing, how this individual came to Christ. Um, let me see where it is. So five years ago, he says, my life was in ruins. Wife and I are fighting going to divorce. I went to the imam, to the mosque for help. He said, here's what you need to do. Go buy a white chicken. Bring it to me. I'll sacrifice it on your behalf. Then go back to your village and meditate and fast for three days and three nights. And on the third day, you will receive the answer to all the problems that you were having with your wife, your children, your animals, and your crops. Okay? And so the imam told him. So he did that. He did exactly what he was told. And it was the third night. He was meditating, fasting, and had a vision. And this is how he explained the vision. I'll never forget it. On that third night, a voice without a body came to me after midnight. That voice said, find Jesus, find the gospel. Wow. Okay, it gets better. He had no clue what that meant. He didn't know if Jesus, who Jesus was. Was Jesus a person? Was Jesus a fruit? Was Jesus, I don't know, a building? Yeah, they would not teach that. Um, so the voice without a body said, get out of bed. Go over the mountain and walk down the coast to this city. When you get to that city at daybreak, you will see two men. When you see those men, ask them where this particular street is. They will show you the way. Walk up and down that street and look for this number. When you find the number, knock on the door. When the door opens, tell the person why you have come. So this guy got up and did that. He went 
right from his bed, woke up out of this vision, dream, whatever, went down to this city. Uh, as soon as he got there, he hiked over the mountain, tricked down the crows, arrived the next morning. He saw two men right where the voice without a body told him. And he asked them about the street and they walked him and showed him the street. And he went up and down the street until he found the building with the number. He knocked on the door. An older gentleman opened the door. Can I help you? The young man said, I have come to find Jesus. I've come to find the gospel. And in a flash, the man's hot shot out, pulled him into the darkened doorway, dragged him into the apartment, slammed the door behind him and said, you Muslims must think I am a fool to fall for this trap. He was one of three Christians in that whole village, and he thought they were trying to find out who the Christians were to kill him. And so this, this man who had this vision said, no, no, I didn't, I'm, you're not a fool, sir. This is, and he told him about the dream. And, and that, that day, the Holy Spirit of the living God appeared in, in, the, in the witness of this man. He became a Christian. How did it happen? It's remarkable, isn't it? He had a vision. He had a dream. The mom said on the third day, it's the answer to your problem. He believed the imam, and he was right. It was the answer to all of his problems. Now, this He's told the, the author of this book, the, the missionary, five years after that, because he wanted him to know how God was working. I believe this was in Somalia is where this happened. Um, fascinating. There are stories like this all over the Muslim world. Why? Well, because in the Hadith, the sayings of the prophet Muhammad, he says, dreams of the faithful are prophetic. It is believed in Islam that the most direct communication God can have with you is through your dreams. And many Muslims have these dreams where God or Jesus or an angel appears to them and something crazy like this happens and they're just trusting enough to follow the voice because they believe it's the voice. And I'm going to say, I think this guy in spite of the imam's white chicken, <laughs> heard from God and had his life changed. Fascinating. Stories like this are happening. But we think we're in the West. You know, we have our Bible. And if you want to get saved, let me give you the EE -E outline. Let me, let me, uh, no, God reserves the right to do whatever he wants. What, is, what does Peter say in Acts 2? It says, this is that from the prophet Joel. In the last days, your young men will prophesy. Your, your, your old men will see visions. Your young men will dream dreams. That's Joel. That's Bible. And it's happening all around the world. It's remarkable. One last. If you're curious, these are three interesting books. This book, I Am In, is from Voice of the Martyrs. Why is it from Voice of the Martyrs? Because this symbol is the Arabic letter N or noon. And in Arabic, or excuse me, Muslim places, what would happen is when somebody would become a Christian, they would go and write this graffiti letter on their house. Why in? It stands for Nazarene. It's marking that house and the people in it as Christians. And this is this book is the story of people who have come to faith in Muslim countries, been marked with a literal mark on their house. That, that means shut your business down or we're tearing it down. It means get out or you'll die. It means we know who you are and we're coming for you. It's not a good mark. And it's a remarkable book that tells story, as you expect, Voice of the Martyrs, they talk about people, not just that are martyred, but the, the, the Christians in the midst of, of Muslim places who, when they find Jesus, are willing to give everything because it costs them. There, there are stories, I don't know if it's in this book or one of the others, um, or even other books that are out there, that, you know, a, a child, a teen or whatever, in a house will come to faith in Christ, and the parents will lock them in their room and not even let them talk to their brothers and sisters, lest they convince them to become Christians. They, they're given food and water at the very least. And maybe ultimately, if they don't repent or recant their faith, okay. you're gone. You're out. Um, they some... one, one family had a, a child, a young man, that became a believer in Jesus, that they had treated this way. And another family 
um, came and invited, uh, her, basically made an offer to, for their daughter to marry the son. And the parents were like, please take him out. It's your problem now. <laughs> Little did they know that family was also a believer and that daughter. And so this, this is how you know, when they out, went, you know, when he got out. Um, and we could, I say, I say it for a lot of reasons. I think these are, are incredible stories to read. They're inspiring stories. They're humbling stories. They remind us how good we have it. So the next time we talk about how persecuted we are as Christians, yeah. we have no idea. <laughs> we really, and, and I'm not saying it might not get to that point. Let's be honest. It could, right? I mean, I'm okay with saying that, but we're nowhere near. And to read stories of people who know the minute they claim Christ will cost them everything and still <laughs> find Jesus worth it is really humbling and inspiring. very inspiring. Yes, absolutely. It's that phrase in that song of uh, People Need the Lord by the King Queen song. There's a, a line in there that says, what, what could be too great a cost to share the love of Christ with this one who's lost? And stuff like this just makes me almost hurt that we are so, so apathetic and so complacent with our easy going, you know. Well, Christianity. Country. I know, but I mean, the point is that there are, you know, we have absolutely no idea what Christianity is at yeah. all. And that separate. somebody that they know what they have when they have Jesus, that they are willing to die and that they're willing. Because they know that they know that they know that they know. And I know we know, but sometimes I wonder how much do we really know that we're not willing even to get spit at or to be called a name. You know, we shy away from telling other people. I mean, I'm guilty. I mean, that's why it hurts so bad to me even that I, I find myself. I'm like, really? You know? You well, shied away. That, that, you know. that's, that's brave. That's, but, you know, that's but, but then like but the that. thing is, if we really knew, I mean, you know, it's like, you know, there's a cure. You're going to run around up and down the streets. Yeah. I found the cure. I found the cure. But we, In this country, we have the guarantee the of freedom of religion. We have I mean, it's, just, so it's, it's very humbling. It is. It is. To, yeah. And it's realized. It's good to read stories for that reason yeah because it does make you remember a lot and it does make you know if you've traveled been to cuba you come back home thankful you meet christians over there and see what they they have to deal with and it's not this i mean it's not like they have a mark on their house and they're going to come shoot them um or behead them which happens but you you come back and you're like oh thankful um, but then we take it for granted. <laughs> we go from being thankful and grateful to, to taking for granted some of the blessings that we have. And it's Who good to be reminded. Who wrote that book, The I Am? And? Um, it's The Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, just The Voice of the Martyrs? Okay. Yeah, it's the publisher. It doesn't have a particular author listed. Okay. And the, the Insanity of God, there's a movie. I don't know how much it, I don't remember how much it deals with um, the particulars of his it does talk about his mission work, but not specifically like that chapter I read. It, it's a part of this, but it's it's a good it's a good it's film. Um, it's it's him in it. It's not a it's not a like a yeah. fake movie. It's it's more of a documentary him yeah. talking and whatnot. You know, my sister was and her husband was military. We served over there almost eight years, over seven, and they lived on the compound. But even on that compound, they couldn't carry their Bible openly. They had to carry it hidden. And they had to change the place of where they had services because they were afraid of that place. If they had met there the second time, they'd be attacked. So even on the compound, there was that fear, but she said it sure made you appreciate your faith. Absolutely. Definitely. Well, that's all I got on Islam. That's probably more than you bargained for. <laughs> uh, a reminder, next week we will not meet. 
Um, it's Denise's birthday, and she has to go see her oncologist. Happy birthday, oh, sure. <laughs> So we'll be up there, and so we won't meet. Uh, don't know when we'll get back. And... Joanne's birthday is on the 20th. <laughs> okay. Happy birthday. Uh, almost six days early. <laughs> so having said that, I'm going to pray, and then we'll call it a night. Father in heaven, we thank you. Even as we just talked about of the incredible grace you have lavished on us. Yes, through Jesus, but also even what it means to have the, the freedoms that we do um, to live in the way that we do. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world that find themselves singled out, persecuted, maybe even facing death, but Lord, still hold tight and hold fast to their confession. But we pray that you would protect them and you would use them. You would use their example of faith in such an extreme situation uh, to so that others in those same cultures would come to know you. Lord, bless us as we continue learning about other faiths and may, through this process, we be encouraged in our own faith and reminded of the treasure that we have in, in our belief in who you are and what you have done through your son, Jesus. And I pray this in his name. Amen.